Hello, my name is Dr. David Palmiter. I'm a practicing clinical psychologist and psychology professor. I've created this YouTube channel for parents and couples in order to offer information that promotes resilience, happiness, and wellness in family life. In today's edition, I'd like to discuss a baker's dozen worth of tips for couples uh, who are trying to negotiate the COVID-19 crisis. Any crisis is like a dragon guarding treasure. Um, with the exception of instances where that dragon is causing death or threatening death, we can look for our opportunities even while the dragon is doing its work. Certainly the treasure is more available to us when the dragon has flown away. But even while it's doing its work on us, we can look for opportunities. So I'd like to go through just 13 things that couples might do um, each of these could be its own separate uh, video, but I'm going to go try to go through them pretty quickly. The first is to brainstorm fun activities. By brainstorming, I mean getting, sitting down together, the two of you, and just developing a list of 10 potential fun things you could do together without evaluating. When we evaluate, creativity shrivels up. So we want to spend the time developing the 10 ideas with neither one of us evaluating. And then when we're done, we can rank order how we like the possibilities and decide on a plan. You might listen to audiobooks, um, engage in video gaming together. There's many games that people can play together. Uh, perhaps engage uh, Netflix binge given the time available. I'm personally partial to Ozark, uh, Pinky Blinders, and if you haven't heard of it, uh, Breaking Bad. It's fan All three of those are fantastic. The second thing is to write down three sexual fantasies or sexual interests that you have that you haven't shared with your partner yet, or maybe shared in passing or shared a long time ago. Write them down and swap them with each other. The two rules are though that uh, there's no mandate for anybody to comply with the sexual interest. Nobody has to feel bad for saying no. And also no one is gonna be made to feel embarrassed or shamed for a particular interest. The third thing is looking for opportunities to be vulnerable with each other. Uh, the dragon's clawing is affecting us all in some negative ways. And so to share with each other what those are and to respond to each other with empathy, not necessarily a game plan for fixing the suffering, but empathy. Um, also, you can acquire the Ungame for Couples on Amazon. Uh, it has a list of discussion topics. And as you're going through the topics, search for the vulnerability, things you wouldn't want to have published in your local newspaper and things which your partner could use against you in a fight uh, at another time, but you're trusting your partner won't do that. Fourth is to consider what your worst reasonable case scenario is for you and your family. Reasonable, I mean, obviously the worst case can be dire for anybody. But what's the most worst case that's reasonable that could possibly happen to you? And then figure out what plan you would have for dealing with that. Uh, fifth is to remember that the tripod of wellness, it resides on physical activity, nutrition, and sleep. So we want to try to make sure that we're getting a good seven, eight hours sleep a night, that we're engaging in at least a half hour of physical activity five times a week, more is even better, and maintaining a proper uh, nutrition, which includes uh, trying to remain sober. I mean, uh, alcohol, other substances can really worsen the overall impact of the dragon. If you'd like to listen to an audiobook or two on the topic of alcohol, I'd highly recommend either Craig Beck's Alcohol Lied to Me or Annie Grace's uh, This Naked Mind. Uh, next is to lean into any spirituality that you share. Uh, not everybody is spiritual, but if you have a spirituality, a belief in something greater than you, bigger than you, to lean into it to a together, uh, together as a couple can be very helpful. Seventh is to try to practice mindfulness. The growing research on mindfulness suggests that it's very healthy for us, uh, both physically and psychologically. Mindfulness simply means tuning into the moment non-judgmentally. Uh, if you want a good introduction to that, look up Eckhart Tolle, 
T-O-L-L-E, uh, on YouTube or his books for a good introduction to mindfulness. Even if he did it five minutes a day, uh, certainly more could be better, but even that would be good. Uh, eighth, to work on personal goals. You know, with this extra time, we all have an opportunity to lean into those goals that we've had for ourselves in the back of our mind, but just didn't feel we had time for. My creating this YouTube channel is an illustration of, of my doing that. I actually try to practice the stuff that I'm talking about. Ninth is to arrange for Zoom contact, a video conferencing, FaceTime, whatever technology you like, um, with family and friends. We're all made for connection, right? So this time of social distancing, it's easy to get into our own little caves and lose uh, the, the value of those attachments. So creating video conferencing opportunities with people we care for. Uh, tenth is to practice gratitude. One awesome way to get going with that is to write each other a gratitude letter. A gratitude letter is about 300 words handwritten that you write down yourself and then read to your partner. You don't put in any, you know, backhanded compliments. It's just purely gratitude. And then uh, read it and then give it to your partner. Don't chicken out and, and have your partner read it. Actually read it out loud. A lot of people will become emotional, but it's a, that's a very bonding experience. Eleventh is to practice at least one or two acts of kindness each week for your partner, regardless of whether your partner reciprocates and regardless of whether your partner expresses appreciation. When we do this, we do it to be on the high road because it's good for us to be kind. And so thinking of one or two things a week that you don't typically do for your partner, that would be an act of kindness. Again, not with that, it's important though not to have any other agenda in the back of my mind when I do that. Twelfth is to give the benefit of the doubt to my partner when they inevitably uh, have rough edges during this time. Um, you know, all of us, I, I once worked with a couple that rarely argued. I was helping them with their teenage son who was depressed. And that's unusual when parents have a depressed teenager that they're not blaming each other for it. And at the end of our work, I asked them what was their secret. And the man explained that the, he, he, using his words, they know the other person isn't crazy. That they know that when the other person is showing some uncomplimentary behavior, that there's a human condition, a human reason behind it that can be empathized with. Uh, lastly, th 13, is to try to create some uh, time for just yourself away from your partner in your residence. Um, you know, some people might do that informally, just sort of, sort of a shared implicit understanding that coffee time is spent apart, or, you know, there can be a stated guideline where from this hour to this hour, we're each kind of doing our own thing, exercising, reading, sleeping, whatever. Uh, but just to create that independent time so we're not grading on each other. We're not like up on each other constantly. Uh, I hope that's helpful, those 13 tips. Like I said, I'll be having videos for many of those topics that'll be standalone videos in the, in the near future. For now, remember, we are made for love.